10 years ago today, on the 4th of August 2011, a 29-year-old man from Tottenham was shot dead by police. Mark Duggan, a father of five, had been under surveillance by Operation Trident, a subunit of the Met tasked with investigating gun crime in the black community. Police stated that Duggan was in possession of a handgun at the time he was shot. Two days later, on the 6th of August, Duggan's friends and family led a peaceful march to Tottenham Police Station. They demanded a meeting with a senior police officer to discuss the circumstances of Duggan's death. When none was forthcoming, the Tottenham riots began. These saw extensive clashes with the police alongside arson and looting. And over the following three days, they would spread to the rest of London and then to towns and cities across England, including Manchester, Liverpool, Nottingham and Birmingham. An overwhelming police presence would ultimately put an end to the unrest. But by that point, £200 million worth of damage had been caused and five people had lost their lives. To discuss the England riots and their legacy, I'm joined by Adam Elliott Cooper. Adam is research research associate in sociology at Greenwich University and the author of Black Resistance to British Policing, Racism, Resistance and Social Change. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Adam. Thanks for having me, Michael. Um, could we start by, I mean, obviously, we're going to talk about the context of this and the, and the legacy, but could we start by talking about the circumstances that sparked these riots, which was the the death of, of Mark Duggan? At the time, there was lots of contradictory information put out about that death. There was um, claims that there was a, a bullet lodged in a police walkie-talkie, which meant that he'd shot at them. Then that was retracted. We have since um, had a public inquest into the death. It ruled it was a lawful killing um i'm sure that hasn't you know that hasn't been accepted by 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 everyone what do we know now about that death about that killing that we wouldn't have known at the time so i guess there are probably three things here the first of i think is the prelude to the killing of mark duggan of course it comes one or two years after the student protests and the tuition fee hike and the cut to the educational maintenance allowance but of course it's also in um, under the looming threat of austerity But crucially as well, what we also saw in the three years leading up to um, the riots was a massive increase in Section 60 stop and searches through an operation called Operation Blunt 2, which saw a massive increase in Section 60s across London. And so like the Sus Laws, which were the prelude to the riots of 1981, we saw a a rehashing of those Sus Laws in the prelude to 2011. I mean, the second thing that's, of course, really important is the the other circumstances in which Mark Duggan was actually killed. As you mentioned, uh, the police and the IPCC uh, reported to the press that there was a shootout between Mark Duggan and the police. This later turned out to be false um, as a police officer had been accidentally shot by one of his fellow officers. um, And the bullet found in his radio was, of course, therefore a police issue bullet. Um, And... What we also found out, I guess, in the aftermath um, was that the police were not really interested in speaking to the family or the community about the circumstances in which Mark Duggan was killed and, of course, far more intent on writing their press releases and their witness witness statements, um, very often in the same room as each other. And then I guess what we then learned, of course, which you also touched upon, was this inquest into Mark Duggan's death which wasn't able to ascertain, despite all of the evidence, how it is that this gun, um, the gun that was recovered from the scene, could be Mark Duggan, Duggan's, since there is no way it could, he could have been holding it when he was shot. He doesn't have any of his fingerprints on or DNA on, and no one, nor the police, uh, nor the prosecution, could explain how it is that it could have been found on the other side of a fence 12 to 15 metres away from his dead body. And so not only are there problems that continue with policing and austerity that led up to this particular protest, there are also, of course, a litany of unanswered questions as to what the exact circumstances were of Mark Duggan's death and how it is the police can seriously consider their reaction to his killing to be something which is in any way respectable to his family or the wider community. Mm, I mean, I think you've, you've summarised really well why people might not be happy with with, with, with that result from, from that inquest. I want to move to um, a, a different element of this related to the criminal justice system, which is probably the most direct result of the riots, which was the pipeline it created from people who found themselves involved, finding themselves in 
prison. And I want to start by showing David Cameron speaking on the 9th of August in 2011, of course. Um, so this is three days or on day three of the riots. I am determined, the government is determined that justice will be done and these people will see the consequences of their actions. And I have this very clear message to those people who are responsible for this wrongdoing and criminality. You will feel the full force of the law. And if you are old enough to commit these crimes, you are old enough to face the punishments. Now, David Cameron obviously is not known for his honesty, but when he said people would be facing punishments, he was right. Over 3,000 people were arrested in relation to the riots and over 2,000 convicted of riot-related crimes. What's probably most significant here is that when sentencing those arrested during the riots, Britain's courts were especially punitive. So according to the Ministry of Justice, this is the government themselves, the average custodial sentence for offences committed during the riots would double the length of sentences laid down for similar crimes in 2010. So people got extra long sentences because the crimes they had committed occurred during the riots. It was the opposite of saying, oh, let's give people allowances because they got caught up in it. It was no, because you got caught up in this, we're going to punish you even more than we would have done otherwise. Adam, could I get you to talk a bit about the the long-term effects of it. I mean, we must have an idea now what it has meant that 2,000 people were convicted of riot-related offences and, and lots of people went to jail. Presumably some people still are in prison. What kind of legacy has that left? So I'm sure most people watching this will be aware that uh, entering prison has a huge effect on your life, whether it be through the kind of negative externalities of making it more difficult to find employment or housing or access further or higher education when you come out of prison, but also the way in which we saw the government's really being quite explicit about how they were going to be punishing people in addition to those, cust those custodial sentences. So proposals to um, have uh, council housing taken away from families for whom uh, people in those families had been uh, convicted of right-related offences. The wholesale regeneration of areas like Tottenham, which saw the cleansing of working-class communities from those council houses. We see, hu we see huge knock-on effects, particularly in, uh, for, our, for younger people who are incarcerated. So young people who are incarcerated in what are called youth detention centres or youth prisons have a two-thirds reoffending rate. So um, the vast majority of them coming back into contact with the criminal justice system and very often the prison system. So there's a whole litany of knock-on effects um, for the people who are arrested in these um, in the disturbances of 2011, many of whom um, uh, this was a, a, a f the first time they'd been arrested and certainly the first time they'd been charged with a serious offence. And so it's, it was tunnelling a huge number of people into an already bloated and expanding uh, prison system in this country. And I mean, we saw obviously there was you know, famous situations of, of people going or getting custodial sentences for stealing a bottle of water. And we also had those 24 hour courts functioning, didn't we? Obviously, Keir Starmer was in charge of the CPS at the time. I mean, how how are people looking back at those events now, you know, within the legal community or, or within academia, the idea that there was this this move to have 24 hour courts because they said this is such an exceptional situation, we need to take exceptional measures. So there've been, I suppose, a, you know, any, any regret about the way that that was all carried out? So I think one of the things that's really crucial about um, the riots was that there were quite clear political interventions into our judicial system. We had people like David Cameron and others making quite clear statements and directives towards the court system, which is really against the kind of political conventions that we have in this country, where at least conventionally there should be some kind of separation between uh, the judiciary um, and um, our politicians. But I think the other thing that we really saw uh, coming out of those riots wasn't um, any kind of critical reflection upon policing um, and the effects that it has, as we saw in 1981, for instance, under the Thatcher government um, and the Scarman report, which reflected on police racism and other forms of inequality um, in relation to those riots. We instead saw the government's doubling down on its expansion on police and prison power. We saw the government doubling down on its commitment to austerity and all of uh, the inequalities that it exacerbates. And I think uh, people watching this familiar with the new uh, policing crime and sentencing bill, as well as uh, the whole wave of other uh, forms of legislation that have been introduced in the over the course of the last decade, will be unsurprised that um, the cur this current government 
um, has probably become even more authoritarian um, and more punitive in its approach to law and order. When people talk about the political consequences of riots, and especially in, you know, in social science, when you're trying to say, well, uh, what, what kind of policies do riots lead to? There's obviously one track, which is sort of punitive responses, which is mainly what we've been talking about so far. There is another idea which it can serve as a, as a wake up call to the political class and, and to the establishment. And they realize if we don't want to see this kind of unrest again, we're going to have to provide young people with opportunities. We're going to have to invest in these places. We're going to have to deal with um, racism or discrimination on the part of the police. Have you seen anything in that second category over the past 11 years or sorry, 10 years? Certainly not. So um, in 2011, when those riots took place, uh, I was working at the time as a youth worker in Hackney. Um, and the youth projects that I was working for was actually established in the aftermath of the 1981 riots. It was a race equality, uh, uh, educational youth projects, particularly targeting black and Asian young people. Um, and it was one of the ways in which the government sought to ameliorate the, um, the issues which had led to those riots. Similar kinds of social investments have not emerged uh, following 2011. Um, and in fact, as, as I mentioned, we've, we saw a continuation of austerity um, following those riots and a total dismissal from the government um, that it could be anything more than, in their words, sheer cr criminality and gangs and gang culture um, that could be held responsible for what we saw in those four days in August. I mean, it's it's interesting to bring up that that 1981 example because obviously, you know, the explanation for why there wasn't this compassionate response to say, okay, we need to provide more opportunities is because we had a very ideological Tory government. They also had a very ideological Tory government in in the 1980s. So, how would you explain that that difference? Do you have a sort of a favoured explanation as to why these rights didn't lead to the same sort of you know, inner city investments that those ones in in the 1980s at times did? So. Uh, the Thatcher government was quite explicit with what their approach was going to be. Uh, they, one of the first things they did was they went to the United States and said, how have you dealt with urban re rebellions? How have you dealt with black rebellions in the late 1960s, early 1970s in the US? And how have you tried to prevent them from happening? And what the key thing that the United States said needed to happen was the creation of a black middle class. A creation of a black middle class could provide, to, could effectively be a buffer between um, the uh, working class, particularly black young people, um, and their and the kinds of rebellions that could arise if they couldn't see or envisage any kind of social mobility or social progress. And that's exactly what the Thatcher government set out to do: developing a black middle class that they could co-opt, um, ideally into their own structures of power, um, and therefore serve as a buffer. And maybe we've seen some of the legacies of that in not only today's very ethnic key diverse cabinets, but also, of course, uh, the Commission for Racial and Ethnic Disparity as well. And finally, could we talk about what would change or what would be different if something like this did happen now? Because as you've said, I mean, from, from, from your perspective, I'm not in a position to disagree. You're saying most of those grievances that, that led to these riots, they still exist. And if anything, they're worse. At the same time, the political environment does seem quite different now. Obviously, back in 2011, we didn't have the Black Lives Matter movement, the media at least, and you know, some politicians do seem more awake to the ideas of, of, of racial inequality and structural racism, for example. These are all concepts which weren't mainstream back in, 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 in 2011. Do you think that we would respond as a society differently to a similar uprising now as we did in 2011? I think that it's important for us to not necessarily always draw clear lines of distinction between uh, so-called rioters and protesters. And I think that what's taken place in the US um, over the last few years, I think is a, a really good way of illustrating that, right? You see a, you see rioting and protest as being a kind of continuum rather than two kind of separate and distinct events. And I think that um, if, we, if a similar um, spark um, arose um, today, then I think we would perhaps have more of this kind of continuum. We'd see people taking to the streets in process that we saw, but potentially alongside the kind of civil unrest that we saw in 2011. And I think in 2011, we saw a great deal of civil unrest and, and only a, a relatively small amount of pro protests. And I think the protests and more organised and less spontaneous elements um, of those rebellions are likely to be um, more robust and more apparent um, if we saw uh, a, something similar arising. Uh, in 2021. Dahlia, I want to bring you in at this point because I'm sure you're going to have uh, a, a lot to say in terms of a, a retrospective on this a, a decade later. And I know, 
you know, this felt at the time, I know, like a really earth shattering event. And it does seem in a way that, you know, you know it seems surprising how, how little impact one can point to. Well, what do you make of that, Dahlia? Well, I think, first of all, you know, there is no Black Lives Matter movement in the UK without the legacy of organising that happened in the wake of Mark Duggan's, uh, in the killing of Mark Duggan. At every protest, you know, Mark Duggan's name is mentioned. This was a key flashpoint of political consciousness, uh, as Adam mentioned, in, in a similar context with, you know, the student protests, student riots and, you know, uh, Occupy movement and this kind of the, particularly around 2010 and 11 global unrest, um, essentially. So this was a this was a key, uh, a key flashpoint. But as well as that legacy of, of political consciousness raising, that legacy of organizing, uh, the, the scars of, of Mark Duggan's killing and the scars of the fact that the cops who did it got away with it. Um, and, you know, the man who was uh, leader of um, public prosecutions is now the leader of the Labour Party. That's really deep, I think, on our on our society. And it's deep in multiple ways. You know, obviously, the, the use of British policing to harass and manage and discipline black people, both uh, here and abroad, has existed since colonialism, as as Adam's book uh, points out really, really amazingly. Um, but but Mark Duggan's death and, and, and like I said, the fact that the people who were responsible for it got away with it um, is in many ways part of that was was a key flashpoint in the legitimization of what is called intelligence led policing, uh, predictive policing, algorithmic policing, where policing doesn't operate on the basis of what's actually happened, but rather on what is predicted to happen. Um, so various proxies like like race, like where you live, how old you are, uh, your educational history are used to mark out people um, as, you know, likely to commit what is called gang violence. Um, and, you know, those 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 people are then marked out for surveillance, for monitoring, for excessive policing. And it's crucial to note that the actual design and the data that is used to inform those processes are not transparent. So we don't know how they, they work. We don't know what factors into them. We don't know what data sets are being used. We don't know the process. Um, so, you know, the whole thing is not available for public scrutiny. And yet it's given this veneer of objectivity or neutrality because it's data driven, um, because it's done algorithmically. And we can see that manifesting in something like the gangs matrix database. Um, and you can imagine how that's going to end, right? You know, when you have algorithmic production of identities uh, being central to policing, um, like, you know, that's going to be incredibly problematic. And like most problematic systems, it always starts with the most marginalized. It always starts with people who can be brushed off as, as disposable. And the reason I connect this to Mark Duggan is not only because of the, the use of intelligence that is, you know, concealed from, pe from public scrutiny as a motivation or as a justification, for, for the killing, but also because I think it really shows us, you know, the killing of Mark Duggan and the press response to it showed us about the work that a term like gang uh, or gangster does, you know, despite the fact that we have, as Adam pointed out, ample evidence that Duggan represented no threat to the police, that there were, you know, indeed holes in the police account of what happened, which, you know, let, let's be frank, that's not new or unprecedented. Um, when it comes to the metropolitan uh, police, you know, despite this, the scrutiny of those who are given extreme amounts of power, i.e., you know, able to walk with a gun and you know use that gun without with with a reasonable with who can and can reasonably expect to not have that scrutinized very much. The fact that that scrutiny was absent from so much of our press in the days following, and yet instead, what we saw was oh, um, you know, it's possible that, that Mark Duggan was in a gang um, or, you know, he had connections to a gang or, you know, things like these kind of uh, weight descriptors and these euphemisms. Does that mean that his life, even if that was true, does that mean that his life is literally meaningless? Does it mean that he deserves to be shot dead in the street, that he deserves to be shot dead in the street by the state and not be given the dignity of a proper, decent inquiry? Like, I think this, this phenomenon of what we call gang violence, um, you know, it is the outcome, as Adam mentioned, it is the outcome of very deep social, political and economic issues. And instead of 
addressing those we are systemically ignoring those core issues and focusing instead on the idea that society just has these irrationally and irredeemably evil people in it who happen to be largely black men who deserve to be you know neglected and and brutalized at will and i think once the state is successful in being able to strip some people's humanity away on the basis of a label like that, that can be given, we need to understand that those labels and that remit only gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that is why under the guise of tackling gun gang violence, um, we have a situation where young people of color, often men are being routinely subject to a range of humiliations and threats to their life and to their liberty from those who are stopped and searched so frequently that they consider it to be part of their daily routine to those who are monitored and surveilled and flagged on databases that has impacts on their lives that they don't even know about um, to kids who are excluded from school to people who are imprisoned and in the case of Mark Duggan who are who are killed. Um, the fact that we allow the state to designate some people's lives and some people's deaths as par of the course, it's a dangerous violation of rights. It implicates us all. And so we should all be putting up a fight against the mechanisms that enable that. But unfortunately, that fight is being left largely to those who have already either faced the consequences, already faced the burdens of that, or, you know, the bereaved the bereaved families and friends and loved ones of those who have died as a result um, of that system. So we need to do a lot better. Um, and, you know, I consider, and Mark Duggan's, uh, the killing of Mark Duggan is a key flashpoint in the recent political history um, of this country, both in terms of the political consciousness and the movement that it has legacy in, um, but also in the nature of the state um, as, it, as it exists today. Adam, before we let you go, I'm not sure if there's you know anything you want to respond to there to what Dahlia has said. But also, if I could ask oh, something that I've just been, I suppose, pondering um, while you've been speaking is we've talked about how you know the legacy of these rights in terms of policy, in terms of media discussions about these issues. Do you have any idea of how they are remembered by people who were participating? I mean, I, I know you've written a book on, on black resistance to British policing. I'm, I'm wondering if you've sort of spoken to people who were involved and how they look back on what must have been, you know, I mean, a performative moment. I don't know. I don't even know really how to describe it. I wonder if you could speak to that. Sure. Um, so I think lots of people, and I think what, what was quite complicated, but also important about uh, the rights is that a lot of people participated in, in it for very, very different reasons um, and therefore had very, very different experiences of it. Some, so for some people, clearly it was an opportunity for direct confrontation with the police. So if you go to somewhere like, look at somewhere like Nottingham, over six police stations were attacked in one night in Nottingham, including with petrol bombs. And it was clear that the young people involved in that confrontation had long and serious grievances with the police that they wanted to have out um, uh, during those nights of rioting. In other contexts, of course, we 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 see large, uh, we see high value goods being appropriated, and for lots of people, it um, in in the the I guess the shadow of the 2007 eight, 2000, 2007 eight crisis, it was an opportunity um, for um, for that kind of material gain that we often see uh, during the riots. But I think for for a, for a lot of people, it really speaks to a kind of a kind of moment of of release and of rebellion. Um, and a lot of people, particularly who were interviewed in the immediate aftermath, talked about revenge as being one of the a, a really powerful impetus for them being involved in that unrest. And to speak, to speak personally for a little bit, for me, it was really a moment in which I saw the mask slip from the idea that uh, Britain is a country that polices by consent. The massive escalation in stops, in searches, in arre of arrests, in raids on people's homes, in people being invited to come to the, to the station for a friendly chat and then saying something which incriminates them and then that leading to an arrest. The amount of cases of police brutality that we had to deal with. The amount of cases of overt racism in which young people were being called the N-word as they were brutalised by the police in the aftermath of the un unrest was really, for me, it was it, it should be intellectually unsurprising, but it could never not be shocking. But the one what, the one thing I really wanted to respond to in relation to what Dali was saying, though, um, was about the press and the other and the, the policing of gangs um, in relation to 
the 2011 riots because um, the police released a number of press statements in the weeks and months after the riots, which describes Mark Duggan as one of the 48 most dangerous gangsters in Europe, despite the, despite the fact that his criminal record, um, I think, only had two things on, um, uh, possession of a small amount of cannabis and handling stolen goods, hardly the um, CV of um, a top um, European international gangster. But I think what's also really crucial um, is that this narrative played a really powerful role in shaping public opinion during the inquiry into Mark Duggan's death. You saw in the same week as the inquiry opened, um, um, uh, the, ev the London Evening Standard starting a campaign called Gangs of London, where they went into the dark heart of London's inner cities. But we also, of course, as Dolly mentioned, saw the expansion of things like the gangs database, where the police, um, where Amnesty International has written reports which have uh, identified how the police call up people who have been put, call up the uh, FE colleges or the housing associations of people who have been put onto the gangs database, further preventing them from accessing the kind of housing or education necessary to live lives which will make, make them less likely to come into contact with the criminal justice system. And this is this expansion of policing into other areas of social, public and civic life, which I think also tells us about how much policing has expanded um, in the 10 years since the riots of 2011. Adam Elliott Cooper, thank you so much for speaking to us this evening. We really do appreciate it. Insightful as ever. Thank you. Um, we are going to go straight on to our next story. After the withdrawal of US troops from Afghanistan, the Afghan government is struggling to fight off an onslaught from the Taliban. Even before the US withdrawal, the Taliban, who governed the country from the late 1990s until 2001, already controlled much of Afghanistan's countryside. They are now making a bid for its cities. For an idea of the state of play in the country, we can look at a map provided by the BBC Afghan Service. You can see on this image that around a third of the country is highlighted in red. That's representing Taliban control. One third of the country is highlighted in blue, representing government control. And a third is yellow, showing areas which are currently contested. What's crucial to note, this doesn't mean um, that essentially it's, it's all completely even in terms of who has control because the government control the places which are densely populated. They control the cities. That's what the Taliban are now trying to to change. They're currently mounting offences in Herat, Lashkar Gah and Kandahar. These are big cities. Kandahar and Herat are Afghan's second and third largest cities, respectively. Yet throughout the nation's cities, despite this threat, defiance against the Taliban is on display. In this clip, you can hear residents of Herat chant, God is great, in support of the security forces and against the Taliban. You'll then see a statement from Afghan President Ashraf Ghani. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Diruz, Mardu Meherat, Wakiate Azirel, Kiki, Shore Allah Bara, as Pish Numaidegi Mekuna, Waki Akome, Hudawanjala Shana Huratam Sil Mekuna, Bawaz Belan Dishap Nushadada. To find out more about the current state of play in Afghanistan, earlier today I spoke to Ali M. Latifi, a journalist based in Kabul. I began by asking Ali how close the Taliban are to gaining control of cities such as Herat, Lashkar Gah and Kandahar. In all three cities, what they've been able to do is to take the surrounding districts so that the cities feel much more constricted and they feel as if they are literally surrounded or under siege. Um, but what's been difficult is actually entering the city, staying in the city and being able to keep the city. Um, you know, in, in Herat, a week ago, they were within 10 kilometers of the city. They were able to reach, you know, the area around the airport, but they weren't able to maintain a presence within the city. They had made inroads, they had gotten into parts of it, but they weren't able to come to the center and officially take control. So that is their aim right now. And if you look at it, you know, Herat, Kandar, Lashkarga, these are three of the biggest cities in the country. They're very important in terms of their geography, in terms of their economic impact. 
in terms of their cultural and historical value. So they're really trying to make a statement with these cities, but so far they haven't been able to actually breach and get into the city centers themselves, which is, which is to them, it's the ultimate prize at this point. What is it that's been stopping them? Obviously, the big fear was that as soon as the US took troops out, then it would be you know, a free for all for the Taliban to, to take over parts of the country that they see as, as valuable to themselves. Why have they been able to be held back um, up to this point? You say that they still haven't managed to get any of these cities or, or hold them. Why is that? They're obviously facing a resistance from the security forces. But we also have much more of these public uprising forces, which is essentially just volunteers from the areas who either had guns at home or who were given guns by the Ministry of Defense or by other officials and, and MPs and things like that, and told to go out and defend their city and their area. And what they've done, for instance, in Herat is they've set up checkpoints in the districts near the city and the areas you know that are much 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 closer to the city to try and hold them back now the issue is that when they try and attack these cities the security forces the uprising forces they can mobilize you know towards so for instance in herat right all, all of the uprising forces went directly towards the airport they helped the security forces the, the government ended up sending more military and special forces and commandos and things like that. And they did the same in Qandar and Lashkargah, but that's not necessarily sustainable. How long can you do that? Um, but it's also difficult for the Taliban because, as I said, these are major, major cities, right? They're, they're home to millions of people um, and they're also big cities. So for them, it, on both sides, it's a matter of forces. You know, it, it's a matter of how many forces can you dedicate to how many places at the same time. And I think this is sort of what's keeping it from getting to the point where the Taliban can fully take over a city because, you know, the government knows to concentrate its efforts, sometimes a little late, but they, they, they know how to do that. And then they send in reinforcements and they send in the uprising forces. And at the same time, the Taliban is trying to attack, you know, two other major cities at the same time and then there has been air support also which is the deal us air support and afghan air support which has also helped so right now they're both testing each other's limits you know um how many places at once can both try and maintain that's really been the difficulty for both sides that's why you see these districts and and and, and villages and things like that trading hands all the time between the government and the taliban the Afghan government is often dismissed as as corrupt or, or, or ineffective, but it mm -hmm. seems that at this moment in time, people are really rallying behind it. We've seen people chanting Alu Akbar as a sort of anti-Taliban chant and, and a pro-government forces chant. Are, are you surprised by the rallying around the, the Afghan government that's being seen now? I think what we have to remember about these uprisings and about these demonstrations is that they're not necessarily supporting the government, especially not the current iteration of the government. They're supporting, first of all, they're anti-Taliban, they're anti this war and this violence, and also um, they're supporting the security forces, they're supporting the uprising forces, and they're really, it's, it's a message of anti-Talibanism. And if they are supporting the Republic, it's more the idea of the Republic, of having, you know, uh, some kind of a democratic system with some kind of um, place for freedom of speech and, and some level of elections and things like that. But it's really, it's not necessarily supporting the government in the sense that it's the president or the f vice president or uh, the, the head of the national reconciliation or anything like that. It's more the idea of, it's kind of like, remember after the attempted coup in Turkey where millions of people turned up to support the state, right? They, they didn't necessarily support Erdogan or the AKP, but they just didn't want a military dictatorship. And in Afghanistan, it's sort of the same. They don't want the Taliban. Um, and and they, they want some kind of a republic more than anything. Does the Taliban have any support? And I mean, if it does, from what parts of society does, does that come? I mean, in these big cities, is it almost universal that people don't want the Taliban to come and take control or are there, there large parts of or a significant minority who do? No, no, the Taliban definitely has support, you know, but unfortunately um, for them, 
what what they're doing is they're they're losing that support day by day in terms of the actions that they've taken if you if you hear the reports that came out of Kandar when they were trying to make headway into the province you know there, there were reports of people being rounded up of people being killed of them going to door to door we couldn't necessarily verify all of these but we had spoken to individuals who had said for instance you know that that a member of their family was in the police and they were given um, assurances that as long as he came forward and and basically reported himself to the Taliban leadership, nothing would happen to him. He came back, he did that, within four days he went missing. Uh, we had other families tell us that in a residential area only maybe about 20 kilometers from the city in Kandar, they saw Taliban fighters lying, uh, laying out IEDs and, and materials for IEDs, or they saw that uh, their family members were shot at for essentially just crossing the street. Um, there have been video of them abusing people, of killing a famous comedian, things like that. That's really working against them uh, more more than anything. And you know, obviously, every every group enjoys some level of support, but unfortunately, uh, for instance, the bombing last night. You know, it happened last night around 8 p.m. Um, and it was an hour before, as you said uh, earlier, uh, everyone was already, you know, in the media, they were saying everybody go out at 9 p.m. and chant Allahu Akbar in support of your nation, in support of your security forces. Um, and so it was seen as a way to shut people up, you know, and it ended up backfiring because in Kabul, in Jalalabad, and in uh, um, Khost, and Kanad, and Bamiyan, people came out. And in Kabul, they stayed out until 11.30 midnight uh, even though you could still hear fire, gunfire, you could still hear explosions, you could still see smoke, people still went out and did all of this. Um, so unfortunately, their actions aren't helping them in terms of their support. And, and finally, what would you like to see from the international community at this point? I should put that in, in, square, in scare quotes, really. As, as far as I understand it, the, the Americans are providing some air cover for the Afghan forces. Does that seem like the right balance to you? The international community, for one, needs to really look back on this war and figure out how it went so wrong, what they did wrong, what their role is. Because the fact that they have to evacuate um, linguists and translators, the fact that they're saying they want to give visas to women and human rights workers and and and, and journalists and things like that, that really sh should make people question what did their 20 years here accomplish? You know, the fact that the Taliban were still able to target the acting minister of defense in the middle of the night or in the evening in, in Kabul, um, in the middle of the city, you know, that should really raise questions. And I think also they have to think about, it's very clear now that Afghanistan's neighbors, Iran, Pakistan, they both, you know, have supported the Taliban in the past. They seem to continue to be supporting them. And, you know, the, the question is, how is how are these countries, you know, 40 countries, NATO, the EU, the US, the UN, they were all here. Which one of them is going to step forward to really put pressure on these countries and say, you know, if, if you're killing our soldiers and, as, as well as you're killing the Afghan people, if they don't care about the Afghan people, their own soldiers are being killed. So I think, you know, the international community really has to question what it did here and what it's going to do to try and resolve the situation going forward. That was Ali M. Latifi speaking to me from Kabul. Before we go on to our next story, I want to say a big thank you, which is because, um, as you'll know, if you're regular viewers, we've had a recent fundraising campaign where we're trying to raise our monthly subs by eight grand um, so that we can continue to expand as an organization so we can put ourselves on a sustainable footing and we have reached our target so we are incredibly grateful for all of you who helped us in this campaign and all of you who are who are regular donors whenever you started donating to us we we really do appreciate it this organization this show is only possible because of your kind support next story The European Union is introducing a new registration system for travellers to the bloc. The European Travel Information and Authorization System, or ETIAS, will require incoming travellers to answer security questions and provide personal data. Passengers' names will be cross-checked against police databases and the results sent by email. ETIAS authorization will cost €7, Euros, which will be a one-off fee and will be valid for three years and for multiple 
entries for anyone who's recently traveled to the US. It's basically the same as their ESTA system. It doesn't strike me as a huge deal. The fact that Brexiteers will have to pay seven euros to go abroad has got some of them really riled up. That anger was evident in this debate between Owen Jones and Carol Malone on The Jeremy Vine Show. Look, we've got Brexit. Brexit's now permanent. We're going to be having Brexit now probably forever. We've left the European Union. I think almost all of us have agreed that's got to be respected. That's got to, be, that's got to happen. But I think people have got to stop pretending it's a cost-free exercise where all the things people who wanted to leave happen and there are no costs. So... All the reasons say Carol voted for Brexit, and there are lots of legitimate reasons why people did vote to leave the EU. I'm not a big fan of the EU. I voted for Remain on balance. But the, this is what people said would happen. We're not a member of the European Union well, anymore. Why do they need to do it now when they didn't do it before? Yes, I know we were part of it. I knew we were part because of we were a member of the European but, Union. Yes, but why? Yes, but That's why do we have good to? Question. Why, why is it necessary to impose a six pound charge? This is you know, Owen, and you're being very um, you're being very calm about leaving the EU. You you thought it was one of the most hideous things on the planet. No, I didn't. But this is just no, I didn't. That's this, not true. This, I even well, debated supporting just, leaving the EU. Actually, well, exactly. The That's the this point. is spite and divisiveness oh, on the part. Of the EU, I mean, yeah, and it's a very odd move considering that they're they're quite a lot of the countries within the EU are very dependent on UK traffic for holiday. They're very they're very dependent well, it, on but, tourism. But hang on, this is part of something called the ETIAS scheme, which applies yeah. to all non-EU countries. So it's it's everyone who's not in the EU. Yeah. So now the question is, is it right, Owen, when Tory MP Peter Bone says this is anti-Britishness in the wake of Brexit? No, look, freedom of movement has ended. One of the main reasons people voted to leave the European Union was to end freedom of movement. Freedom of movement is now ending, and the quid pro quo of that is we're not members of the European Union and we are now subject to visa charges. If you're not members... if It's the same with other countries. There's several other countries on the planet where in order to enter, you have to pay a visa charge. If we were still members of the European Union, there would be freedom of movement and we wouldn't be subject I to these visa charges. it's quite a big story, this, Carol, isn't it? Because it's going to increase costs for people going on, you know, relatively cheap, sunny holidays. And I think, but I think it also reaffirms in a lot of people's minds that they were quite right to vote to leave this this <laughs> controlling organisation. No, which controls it. We're not members so, anymore. So... <laughs> I thought that was actually a very good bit of television. My favourite line there, Dahlia, was I said, why are they doing it now when they didn't do it before? You know, they, they, this must be incredibly spiteful. I mean, it's exactly the same. Why aren't we paying the European Union millions of pounds a week when we did it before? It's because we left the European Union. Why, why, can't, why can't people from Romania and Poland come and work here without a visa like they could before? It's because we left the European Union. It's so bizarre, isn't it? I mean, it's like fully absurd, right? And I think that, you know, I'm sure many hardline Remainers are going to be looking at this as kind of a moment of schadenfreude. But obviously it, it's it's sad. And it's, it's also not the headline story of what happens when you put restrictions on freedom of movement. That is, you know, the casualties of that are much more serious than like a seven euro charge on something. But it's, you know, it's just, it, it, it's sad to watch. And I think, I also think, and not to get too kind of like, I don't know, academic about it, but I think the the reason we find it so amusing is because what's happening here is that is is that the extent to which freedom of movement has always been seen as a racialized right, right, is is coming through, but it's coming through through an unlikely vessel. And that unlikely vessel is Carol Malone, who comes from a political tradition where, you know, the nation state or like a collection of nation states um, and, you know, the right of nation states to sometimes violently assert its borders is not only an unquestionable right, but it's a right that supersedes all other rights. You know, nothing is, nothing is, is is more important in the face of it. And, you know, we're told that's common sense. It's, you know, the natural order of things. And yet the idea that it would be imposed upon British people and specifically white British people like her is, you know, now is being seen as a 
is, is, is it has her clutching her pearls. And, you know, the idea that what was once the inalienable right of a nation state to control its borders or whatever is now, you know, it's shocking. It's unfair. It's driven by, by vengeance. It's driven by emotion and irrationality and hatred. And it's a thing that, you know, it's the pathology of a controlling institution, which I found hilarious because I'm like, that's the nation state. No, you know, like the gag is that, you know, all borders are kind of driven by emotion and, you know, a desire to control. And it seems obvious to point out, but it's because like whiteness and specifically white Britishness has always been defined in part by its mobility and the fact that it has mobility in comparison to others. And it's defined by its ability to move freely and in and around and through any space that it desires and not only move through it, but transform that space according to its desires. You know, that that's kind of what colonialism is. So what's being exposed in this video is that, you know, what we were told was unavoidable and natural and common sense only has those properties when it's being used to sort of protect and preserve existing power um but it also is just funny to watch carol malone sort of lose her shit on on air um especially when it's over something that you know she a couple of years ago was fighting vociferously for what i like about clips like this is you know we were never big romaniacs and one of the weakest arguments of of the romaniacs was sort of to to take something that is actually quite insignificant on the grand scheme of things and make it seem like it would be the absolute end of the world if this were to stop being the case. So roaming charges or something like that. We can't possibly leave the European Union because it will cost you more in roaming charges. We'll have to pay some money when we download a meme in Italy. I don't know. I don't know how these things work. And uh, 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 the argument to that from, you know, the Brexiteers was reasonably, you know, we think sovereignty is more important than this. Maybe secretly they were thinking we think you know, reducing immigration is more important than this. But the idea that there are more important things than roaming charges is a fine political argument. What's happened now is we've gone full circle where it's the Brexiteers who are saying that these really minor small benefits of being in the EU, like you don't have to pay seven euros to go on holiday, that these are now like the end of the world. So like, I, I can't believe we're possibly having to pay seven euros. You only have to do it once every three years, by the way, to, to go to France or Portugal. They now think that's a huge political issue when the whole point of the referendum campaign is them saying, well, these things don't actually really matter. It, it doesn't matter about roaming fees. It doesn't matter if you're going to have to queue slightly longer at the airport and, and not have the you know checkpoint free travel because what really matters is sovereignty and democracy now we've got sovereignty and democracy well you know i'm not necessarily buying into the argument that we have more sovereignty and democracy now we probably have a little bit more now we've got that they're like oh actually these minor inconveniences they really matter and they matter so much that i'm going to go on tv to rant about it in front of the nation completely ridiculous any final brief thoughts on this one dahlia before we go on to our final story yeah, I think that's such a good point because it's also, I mean, I think that, that if I was Carol Malone and I was trying to kind of cover my back and trying to seem like, you know, I'm consistent and I'm knowledgeable and I'm reasonable, which I'm not sure if that is what Carol Malone tries to do every time she goes on TV, but I would be like, okay, I'm going to take this story and I'm going to say, you know, if this is what liberty costs, then seven euros, I'm happy to pay it every three years. But it's the, the entitlement and the kind of the 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 you know, a racialized entitlement, it's too strong and it's too much the core of her politics that she just can't help herself, even though it would be far more politically astute to kind of flip this on its head. I totally agree with that. And I do, you know, I, I think that is partly where there's an expectation that you can go anywhere and that border control shouldn't apply to you. I, I, I don't think that's that's a reach to say that's what's going on there. Let's go on to our final story. I think we can get an image up for this before I start speaking. A fit and healthy 42-year-old man has died of COVID after refusing to be vaccinated. John Ayers was a father of one from Southport, Merseyside, who worked in construction. Ayers enjoyed weightlifting and mountain climbing. In fact, he had been climbing in the Welsh mountains just four weeks before his death. Ayers passing leaves behind his mother and twin sister, who have been warning others not to think that they are invulnerable to the virus. Since Ayers' death, his sister has tweeted, 
The only pre-existing health condition he had was the belief in his own immortality. He thought if he contracted COVID-19, he would be okay. He thought he would have a mild illness. He didn't want to put a vaccine in his body. She also said that before he was ventilated, he told his consultant that he wished he had been vaccinated, that he wished he had listened. His death is a tragedy. It shouldn't have happened. He leaves a mum, a dad and sister and a 19 year old daughter. She goes on to say, my two children have lost their fun uncle, the uncle who would always play with them, the uncle that dressed up as Father Christmas on Christmas Day. My mum has lost her baby boy, my niece, her much loved and needed dad. Now, occasionally you see sort of stories like this shared on on, on Twitter as a sort of ha-ha, which is obviously you know an, a horrible reaction to anyone's passing, and we're not intending to do that. But I think the reason why people do raise cases such as this, and clearly why his family are happy to, to raise cases such as this is to encourage other people to get vaccinated. Thankfully, in, in Britain, we, you know, vaccine scepticism is 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 a real uh, minority sport. Not not many people are sceptical of, of the vaccines. We've got almost 90% of people who have their first dose, but clearly even 10% of people not getting vaccinated because they have some wrong-headed ideas about it. That's tragic if it then leads to, to their deaths and, you know, rips families apart. Dahlia, I want to go to you on, on this particular case. I mean, it goes without saying this is obviously a, a tragedy, but how how effective do you think it is? I've seen it loads on social media, more in America for obvious reasons, because vaccine skepticism is, is a much bigger deal there, to have sort of the family members of people who refuse to get vaccinated coming out and sort of speaking about how this is a clear example of why you should go and get jabbed. I mean, this is this is really, really devastating, uh, of course. I think that it is really crucial that families who have experienced this come out with these with these messages, not because I think that it's going to sway, you know, the most most ardent anti-vaxxers who, you know, exist in the kind of who are in a whirlpool of conspiracy theories, but you know, I think more that that middle ground, kind of the unsure people, I think particularly younger people who might think this isn't going to affect me. I'm going to be fine. I'd rather not. I think those are the constituency, which I think probably makes up the more people who aren't being vaccinated than the people who are sort of ideologically immovable, hard line. Hopefully putting a human face um, to these stories will help to shift that that kind of more uncertain group. You know, we do know from the data, you know, I mean, anecdotal evidence from the NHS suggests that, of course, you know, as we would expect, the proportion of vaccinated people who are now dying of COVID um, is very small compared to unvaccinated people. Uh, we don't have the exact data from the UK, but we do know in the US that, you know, of the more than 18,000 COVID related deaths that happened in May, just 150 of those um, were fully vaccinated. So this means that there are so many deaths that are avoidable through, through vaccination. It's also why, you know, you kind of have to bring it up. It's also why the fact that for, for many big pharmaceutical companies, the fact that it's devastating that the, the the vaccination program is being seen as a money making exercise rather rather than um, and you know using intellectual property laws in order to prevent the vaccine from being reproduced cheaply and on mass rather than seeing it as you know a program that needs to get as many people in the world vaccinated as possible it's being seen as you know a money making exercise and so we have vast parts of the world where because of pro corporate profiteering, people who desperately want the vaccine um, can't get it and so are at similar risks to the one that we, the story that we've just heard. But I also think, you know, of course, anti-vaccine propaganda is, is a huge part of this. Actually, it made me think of how when I was going to get my second vaccine, um, there were people outside picketing, trying to give me a leaflet, telling me that the vaccine was more likely to kill me than COVID. And I was like, sorry, guys, like it's already way up in my bloodstream. So too late. Um, but but it's also, I think, a, a, a consequence of consistent messaging, both in the media, um, across mainstream media, and at times, even from our own government, that this is somehow an illness that you only need to worry about if you're older, um, or if you have underlying conditions. Now, of course, you know, even if that were true, even if this were an illness that exclusively impacted older people or people with underlying con conditions, we still would all have an urgent collective duty to wear masks, to get vaccinated, to, to protect those, pe those people. 
But it's actually not even true. You know, we know that, of course, COVID does cause deaths amongst, you know, younger, healthy people. But also that, you know, more commonly, we know that it has unpredictable and as of yet incurable uh, long term impacts on the health of young people. I know three separate people, one of whom has had diabetes triggered by getting COVID, one of whom has permanent lung scarring as a result of COVID, and people who have, you know, are still months and months later experiencing debilitating fatigue and breathlessness that stops them from going about their everyday life, um, all of whom are under 30 lead an active lifestyle, lead a healthy lifestyle, we still don't know why those impacts manifested in the way that they did. And yet, how many times have you and I sat on this show and, you know, pulled our hair out at people like Julia Hartley Brewer, who talks so nonchalantly about the idea that there's no reason why young people should get vaccinated, because, you know, it's a it's a young person, it's an old person illness. Um, or, you know, saying that, you know, oh, so few people who are under 60 die from this. So why are we all having to restrict? Now, I'm not sure if Julie Hartley Brewer has specifically spoken about vaccines. I know that she uh, has a kind of wants to drop the mask mandate for this very reason, saying, you know, it only affects people who are over 60. So that is a message. And we know from the, from the leaked texts uh, that Dominic Cummings uh, leaked that Boris John- where Boris Johnson was sort of talking about, again, oh, this doesn't matter because it only affects older people. That message is not only unethical because it sends this message that older people aren't worth protecting, but it also sends this really wrong message that young people have nothing to worry about. And that's also legible in policies that have sent the largely younger workforce back to these high-risk jobs in hospitality, in bar jobs, without them necessarily being vaccinated and also dropping things like the mask mandate in sectors where a lot of young people are working and not to mention um, the fact that many young people who work in these kinds of high-risk jobs don't have access to um, sick pay. So at these multiple levels, this, this myth that you know, young people don't have anything to worry about, that if you're young and healthy, you have nothing to worry about, which we also heard from Joe Rogan. It's actually not just in the confines of conspiratorial internet corners. It actually is also uh, a myth that is commonly perpetrated across mainstream outlets as well, despite scientists and, you know, doctors trying to, to communicate the exact opposite message that we all have to be concerned and we all have to take measures um, to protect ourselves and other people. I should emphasize Julie Hartley Brewer, as we discussed on this show, does share a lot of disinformation when it comes to COVID-19. She thankfully is not an anti-vaxxer, even among our sort of right-wing pundit- punditocracy, a difference between here and, and the United States. Mm. Vaccine skepticism among, you know, is, is very rare. It's just people like Lawrence Fox. Um, very few people um, in in the establishment media are, are willing to to take a, a similar line to that. One thing I want to show you with this story is, is about you know who is and who isn't an anti vaxxer One worry I had when we started planning this story was I don't want to assume this guy was an anti vaxxer because there are lots of people who haven't had a vaccine yet, which could be for a number of different reasons. Maybe they're a little bit hesitant. Maybe you know they're they're worried about having a day off work if they feel a little bit sick for a day. I mean I think that's going to be very few people who make that judgment because getting it is much more disruptive. But in any case, you don't have to be an anti-vaxxer to have not had the the vaccine. It does seem like this guy was, though. At the time of his hospitalisation, Jenny McCann revealed that her brother had been a staunch anti-vaxxer. So she tweeted, to all anti-vaxxers, my staunch anti-vaxxer, non-mask wearing 40-year-old twin is now in hospital with COVID and pneumonia, rushed in an ambulance as he struggled to breathe. Quite simply, if he'd had the vaccine, he wouldn't be get the vaccine. So he clearly was someone who had bought um, the, these false arguments, um, telling people not to take the vaccine. And also, you know, to give us an idea of what these anti-vaxxers are about, the Daily Mail also reported that in a further tragic twist, the devastated Mrs. McCann has now been targeted by anti-vaxxers on social media, with some accusing her of being paid by the government, while others said they were not buying the story. All quite despicable stuff. Let's wrap up there. Dahlia Gabriel, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you this evening. 
Pleasure to, to speak to you too. Thanks for saving me from a lawsuit there. Um, <laughs> I got my mask, my anti-maskers and my anti-vaxxers <laughs> confused. But, you know, at some, to some extent, there's a continual message there, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, or I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to make that clear. Julie Hartley Brewer spreads enough disinformation without us having to uh, add anything to the pile. Thank you so much for watching the show. If you haven't already, do hit the subscribe button. If you would like to become a donor and you haven't already, please do go to navarromedia.com forward slash support. Thank you so much. If you have already, we'll be back on Friday at 7 p.m. You've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarro Media. Good night.